This is a story that's guaranteed to piss you off because Dan, the CEO and founder of ChainGuard, he quits Google without even having an, an idea of what to build. And then six months later, at literally the peak of the market, he raises $50 million from Sequoia with no revenue, no deck, on like a handshake deal after a dinner meeting. From the outside looking in, it sounds completely just unbelievable. But the fact is, it happened. And now, and just two, three months ago, he closed another $140 million Series C, now has over 100 customers, $250,000 ACV. So he's doing tens of millions of dollars, which is another way to say crazy things happen in startup land. And sometimes it just works out. Welcome to the Product Market Fit Show, brought to you by Mistral, a seed stage firm based in Canada. I'm Pablo. I'm a founder turned VC. My goal is to help early stage founders like you find product market fit. Dan, welcome to the show. How's it going? Good, dude. Can't complain. Everything's you. Good. Thanks for having me on. No worries, man. Look forward to uh, to the story. I mean, you've had you've had a pretty crazy ride and uh, really wild, like just fundraising history. I mean, five million dollars out of the gate, and then fifty million from Sequoia Capital, which I always wonder, like, if it's the biggest thing raising the money or just getting Sequoia on your cap table because, you know, like every founder starts off and that's like the number one, I mean, it's the number one brand, dude. So we'll, we'll go through uh, all of that. They're great to work with. You know, that's like, that's the question, right? And I think, I mean, most founders don't get to discover it is like, are they as good as, as, as their brand, right? Because like, you know, they've just been in the game for so long back so many of like monumental founders. So we'll, we'll jump into that. But like, I guess the first question is, you know, you, and we've had other founders before that that have kind of had this path, right? But it's not an easy one, right? Like you were at Google for what, like nearly a decade before kind of taking a jump into into startup land. Um, so maybe walk me through that, like just really eye level, not not too deep, like what you did at Google, but then more importantly, like how that jump happened. What made you decide to leave? So I started there uh, just an entry level engineer um, working on uh, some Google Cloud stuff like in the super, super early days before Google Cloud and AWS and Azure were really blowing up as businesses. So it felt like a tiny part of the business. Like we were off in a corner while everybody else was doing ads. Worked on a bunch of stuff all throughout Google Cloud infrastructure and security. And so where when I left, I looked back and it was like Google Cloud is like 66% of Google by headcount now. It's crazy. And I was like, when did that happen? Um, like when did we stop being an ads company or something? And I think my revenue was probably still ads, but definitely by people. Uh, it's turned way more into an infrastructure company throughout that time. But um, yeah, I got really worried about open source security kind of sometime through that time frame because I watched uh, what Google did on an internal security side after like the Project Aurora stuff, like the Snowden papers. Everybody kind of remembers that from like 2012, 2013. Um, it's kind of this shift in thinking about security from like, oh, it's just hackers out to like, oh no, there's nation states that are like way more funded than even the biggest tech companies that have as much time in the world. Um, you have to change the way you think about security. Then public cloud, open source started blowing up kind of through that time. And all that same internal security stuff we had for Google's internal infrastructure, everybody just kind of forgot about. Um, and that got me pretty worried. The attack on solar winds happened. All of a sudden, everybody started paying attention to software supply chain security and that kind of thing. This was when, by the way, like what, what solar year? Solar winds was uh, end of 2020. Um, and so the whole space, the area I'd kind of been worried about and working on started to blow up and everybody was paying attention to it in security. That's kind of how security happens. Um, you know, you can talk about stuff all day long and until attackers actually start looking at it, uh, nobody cares. Um, my co-founder, Matt, uh, and were those, by the way, specifically like open source projects that had security issues? No, SolarWinds was a little bit different. Um, it was an attack on, you know, the big company, um, where somebody compromised their build servers and then used that instead of just attacking the company to then like inject malware into the product they were selling to all of their customers. So it was like this pivot from instead of just attacking one company to all of their customers. And like they had some really sensitive ones. So it was a huge national security impact. And it's very different to then in, instead of just worrying about your stuff, worrying about all of your vendors, all of your dependencies, kind of your whole supply chain, your whole software supply chain. Open source is a huge component of that. So that's kind of how that fits together. Um, but it's, yeah, a, a big shift in the way people think about security. Open source is a big component of what? Of the, of the supply, supply chain? supply chain, yeah. Um, like if you write code, you're using tons and tons and tons of open source written by people you've never met. Anybody on the internet kind of 
uh, it's a little scary if you look at it that way. Yeah, then my co-founder, Matt, took some time off. He took a sabbatical just to do barbecue um, during the pandemic. Um, and I kept trying to get him to come back to work. Uh, and one day he finally texted me and said, all right, I'm done barbecuing. I'm ready to work again. How about uh, we quit and do a startup though instead? Uh, of me coming back to Google. And I hadn't really thought about it much, but I was like, this seems obvious. Uh, basically putting notice right after that. Why? Like, I mean, walk me through that. You gloss over it, but it's not... I mean, I, I, mean, I wonder if the text message calculate. saved. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it just didn't... It's like, yeah, it's, if I think about this too much, I'd probably change my mind. But um, <laughs> uh, that, this does seem like a good idea. Let's go do it. Did he have an idea or it was just like, hey, let's just start something? Uh, yeah, it was, let's, we started talking about, you know, what we do right after that. But um, yeah, it, it, we didn't really have too much of an idea going. I mean, it sounds like you might as well take the time within Google to think through what you want to do before leaving. Like, how? I mean, it was a bit of a transition. I mean, I was managing a team. I handed that stuff off before I actually left. But yeah, basically started planning right away. What attracted you to it, though? Or like, did you think to yourself, I mean, part of there's a rational piece, which you might say, like, well, if it doesn't work, I'll just go back to Google. Like, did you do that kind of calculus? Or, or how did you think? Probably. About it? But yeah, it's like, yeah, what else am I going to do this? This seems like a pretty good idea. I've got Were you born at that already. Point, 10 years into Google? Yeah, a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it, yeah, I, I honestly really didn't think about it too much. It just seemed obvious. And I had a great move. I've loved working with Matt my whole career. And it was like, yeah, I see. So it was more like the person. It was like, oh, he's the right person to do this with sort of thing. Yeah. So jumped in, figured out what we wanted to do. Um, the whole space sort of, I mean, it was pretty obvious, like this whole space and security was blowing up. So we figured we'd find something to do in this area. So you knew high level, like you knew this, the problem space, like it was probably going to be something around security? I guess we knew the problem area um, and got going that way. We raised our seed around pretty much right away. Um, I mean, what did you raise your, your round on? Like, what's the story there? It was 2021, man. Um, yeah, just quitting Google <laughs> was enough. Um, it's a little bit more than that, but um. Well, yeah, no, but like, oh, what did you? It's because there's truth to that, right? But I think you go in, you're like, we worked at Google for 10 years, but what did you? You still got to like tell, say something, even though it, it might be not fully big. So what did you cut? What was? Oh, I mean, literally, I just like pulled up my inbox and I was just like, oh, these investors have been emailing me to chat about if I'm ever going to quit. Let me just respond to some of those emails and see. And um, yeah, I remember we went to some of those meetings and I was like, cool, you guys are nice. Uh, you seem good to work with, like. What do you want to see before you invest? And they were like, just quit. Uh, and it was like, all right, then that's all. Yeah, we didn't do a pitch deck or anything like that. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. But did you say to them, I think we want to do something in security? Or these are the problem areas we want to explore or what? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's part of the conversations. Um, yeah. Uh, the supply chain security stuff. Like I'd done a bunch of public work and open source stuff. So um, yeah, uh, I think they generally had an idea of what area we'd go. But they just said, like, these are two smart, like, ex-Google guys. Like, they know security. Like, they'll figure something out. And they give you five million bucks. Not a million bucks. You know, five million bucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we hired a team. There's got to be a lot of founders listening to this that just pissed, dude. <laughs> I mean, I mean it's, yeah, if, if you want it to look like that, go back to 2021. I don't think it's that easy anymore. Yeah, I, it probably shouldn't have been that easy. <laughs> what does that do for you? I mean, let me, let's, like, get serious a little bit because it's like, I don't know. I mean, there's pros and cons to, to raising money. And I think all else equal... If you're super rational and somebody says, here's 5 million bucks on crazy terms, you got to take it. But the thing is, what do you do with that, right? Because the, the flip side is there is something to having smaller or less people being super resourceful in those early days. You know, what did that do to have that $5 million and feel like, you know, we can spend a lot on a lot of, like we can spend a lot on a lot of things with $5 million when you're starting from just two of you guys. Yeah, I mean, we, we got hired pretty quick. And, you know, that's that's the hardest thing. Like the first couple of hires you have to make at a startup, like they're taking the biggest risk, especially when you have no idea what you're going to be doing, especially back then too. Like the tech job markets were crazy. Big companies paying insane amounts. This is like pre layoffs, pre RTO stuff. Um, so hiring is hard back then. Um, and yeah, getting that initial team going, it's a uh, big focus and then figuring out what we wanted to do kind of at the same time. How many people did you hire like kind of right off the bat? I think our team, yeah, we grew up, uh, it's say 10 or 15, somewhere in that range. Uh, mostly engineering product, uh, that kind of thing. Now, 10 to 15, when you did figure out what you wanted to build or when you were still figuring? We had ideas. Um, yeah. So we, we tried to build a lot of stuff early on just to see what was going to stick. Um, what were some of those ideas and like, how did you arrive at them? Just, I mean, we were doing a bunch of open source work. We were just doing a bunch of stuff publicly, getting attention that way. Um, the the state of security too, like the area we were in back then, like it was all over the national news constantly, right? Um, Log4j, um, big, uh, if you're familiar with that one, it's a huge open source vulnerability, basically worst case scenario, it hit pretty much everyone in the world. That was like two or three months after we started. And so like the space was just incredibly hot, but 
early. So like it was incredibly easy for us to go get conversations with anybody we wanted, any enterprise company out there, like kind of for our name somewhere. They knew the space. They knew it was a problem. So pretty easy to get like early feedback, early validation on things. But then the flip side is like nobody's ready to do anything yet. So it was like a couple of years of like market education and market awareness that we kind of waited through. Why was nobody like if people are getting hacked left, right, and center on open source, why are they not willing to do anything? It's roadmaps, maturity, awareness. And I think there's also this angle, which is like, you can kind of look at it like tailwinds. And I think a lot of investors saw it as tailwinds, but um, like regulation. So like there was a lot of regulatory stuff that came down in the wake of SolarWinds and Log4j from the government, um, which is good because it like means something eventually has to get done here. But then the downside is it runs on government timelines. And like there's an executive order from the Biden administration about this, but like executive orders don't just say you have to be secure. They're like, this agency is going to go put a framework together and then this other agency is going to figure out how to So people it. on this wait and see mode. Yeah, they're That's like, we're going to have to do something, but like, I'm not going to do it until someone makes me um, kind of thing. So yeah, it, it, it's good because it gets you a lot of attention, but also like when the government's like, you're going to have to do this in five years. It's like, all right, I got four and a half more years before I'm going to actually do anything about this. And what are some of those early ideas? Because look, at the high level, and I'm an outsider to cyber, right? But like, okay, the problem is, some of this open stuff, source stuff is not safe. That's okay. The problem's like, quote unquote, obvious. How do you solve that? <laughs> like, what the hell Yeah. I mean, from the government, it, it came out as like this 278 page, like set of requirements from NIST called the secure software development framework that touches everything. So it's like kind of in the space we're in too, it's like, there's no silver bullet, no one size fits all answer, like no magic thing. Anybody could go and sell you. Um, so it was like more of a journey of like, what are people actually going to take action on now, um, as part of all of this? And it's not just like, cause if you'd listen to security pitches, like you could go to some security pitch day and hear a hundred good ideas and they're all good ideas. But at the end of the day, you only have time and a team and resources to do one of those a quarter. And so it's like kind of hard to get feedback and let us the wrong way on some of those early ideas around like, oh, everybody says this is good. Let's go do that. And it's like, oh, but like we're number 17 on a list of a hundred priorities. Like what do we actually do that's going to get to like get higher on that? Um, so we started with two different products, um, kind of around the same time. One is the product we're working on and selling now called Chain Guard Images. We'll talk about that one in a little bit. Um, the other one was Chain Guard Enforce, we called it. And it was this policy visibility control kind of dashboard for the software development process. So it is, you'd install this thing, it would watch the way developers were writing code, the commits, the CI systems, how it's built, how it's deployed, and make sure that it's going through all these gates. And it sounds great because you need that level of visibility and control. Um, and people love the idea of it. And then kind of the, at the end of the day, it's like, oh, uh, nobody wanted to roll this thing out because it made developers' jobs harder. And it was like, that's kind of the entire point is making developers' jobs harder. Um, of course, nobody wants to roll this thing out. Because what happens every time you want to do a pull request, it's got to go through some new... Yeah, kind of- you've got to make sure it goes reviewed. you got to make sure all the dependencies are approved. You've got to make sure the build system's secure, kind of all this stuff. And and by the way, maybe a stupid question, but how does this take care of the open source? Like, isn't the open source the thing that you kind of start with? And then, I mean, you build on top, so you're, you're controlling the build on top. But Yeah, it didn't really. It was more like, is the stuff you're using approved? Are people just downloading random things from the internet, which everybody is doing, and everybody knows they're doing it. And it's like, I remember one customer meeting, and they're like, all right, this tells me none of my stuff is secure. Great, right, I already knew that. Like, why would I pay you to tell me that? Um, and we're like, because now we'll help you get better and we can monitor you getting better. And they're like, yeah, eh, maybe next year. Did you get deep on building this product or did you just kind of pitch it and realize? Yeah. I mean, we, we had design partners. We built it. We sold it. Um, yeah. We, yeah. Um, and then uh, we're working on two at once, right? We raised all that money. Um, we had a pretty big engineer team. We actually split it in half and we built both products at once. Um, I mean, they say you're supposed to focus. You're supposed to just do one thing. Uh, you didn't. In a sense, it's work because you are where you are now. But like looking back, was it the right decision, wrong decision? Or like, why did the focus maybe not apply? I mean, we knew it was a little bit risky. It's like with enterprise sales like this, it's like three, six, nine month deal cycle. So it's really hard to get feedback of like, are people actually going to pay for this thing? Um, And they want it. They're doing POVs. They're trying stuff out. Things get delayed. And then you sort of hit like the market crash too in 2022 as we're going through all of this and nobody had budgets and it slows down feedback cycles. So it's kind of a way just to try more things at once, knowing that like both probably wouldn't work. It would have been crazy if both ideas we had worked. But um, yeah, we started, it was on purpose. Like we started with two things about as far apart as you could be, hoping one of them worked. <laughs> um, and yeah, we got pulled the wrong way early. We signed deals, big customers, started rollouts of it. How far did you get like, let's say revenue wise on that, on that product? About a million in ARR on that product. Yeah. Um, it just took a long time or what? 
yeah, it took a long time and then it uh, basically completely stalled. Like we weren't getting any more pipeline. Even the implementations were stalling even after people bought the thing. How does that happen actually? Because that's a surprising thing. Like I'll tell you as been a main founder and speaking to a lot of founders, there's this belief that like, you know, they say like, if you sell to one person, you sell to 10. Like if you can get to a million ARR, like you can get it to 10. You know, there's this kind of baked in belief. It's obviously not true because a lot of companies stall at a million, but what happened in your case that you were able to do what should be really hard, which is go to zero to one, but then it just stalled at one and it wasn't, you know, easy to get to five or 10 or whatever. Yeah. So, so we were doing both at once, right? We got to around a million on that first one. The second one, um, we, we kept working on it through that. Um, and all of a sudden it just kind of started to shift. Like even the same customers we talked to about both, we'd go into demos and do both products and they're like, cool, this one makes more sense or something like that for in, the enforced product. Um, six or seven months later, we kept working on the other one. It finally got better and better shape. People understood it more. Like our pipeline just completely shifted. Um, like nobody was reaching out about Enforce, even the customers we sold it to, like we're stalling on rolling the thing out. And uh, the image products basically passed it in revenue and pipeline was like 10 to 1 the other way. Um, and then uh, like we couldn't even keep up with the demand for it. Like uh, all of a sudden a bunch of big deals closed that we were waiting on and we we're kind of like this oh shit moment of like, now we got to go get the product ready because you're always kind of selling things a little bit before they're ready and everything. Um, and it was like, I mean, maybe if we kept forcing it, the other one could have gotten there too, but we just didn't have the resources anymore. It was like, all right, we got to take everybody, the whole company and just support these other deals that we sold. This thing's growing clearly faster. You can see it in every metric. You can hear it in every conversation. Um, and so, yeah, in a couple of quarters throughout like 2022 and into 2023, it was uh, just completely pivoting around the other way. So what was this other product, which is your current product, the one that worked? Um, that's the open source one, basically. Um, it's a safe source for open source. So we're building and... Oh, so the first one actually didn't even have to do with open source necessarily? Oh, not really. I mean, it's part of it. Um, what it looks like today is it's this set of container images that we build and harden and maintain and patch uh, full of open source code. So it's the same open source code everybody's already using, but they get it from us and they um, we patch all the vulnerabilities. We update all the dependencies. We keep it all up to date for you. So you don't have to worry about it. So instead of like a tool to tell you about your supply chain issues, we just fix a whole bunch of them for you. Um, and you just point your developers at that and they're happy. Yeah. So the the really simple ways, if you're a dev, you want to use anything open source, just go, you just go to ChainGuard, you get it from there and you know, like it's got that stamp of approval sort of thing. Um, and I mean, we, we keep adding to it. There's like 900 images we have available today. Um, we're adding like 100 a month, something like that to it. Um, just growing it based on all the open source out there because we don't have all of it yet, but uh, hey, we want to get to that point. And what guarantees, like this may be a stupid question, but what guarantees that that because it's on chain guard, it's secure? Yeah, I mean, the simplest one is like vulnerabilities um, and known ones. So like if you scan, there's tons of container scanners out there and security products. And if you point them at the containers you're typically running, like the Python image, the most up-to-date Python image, if you're going to start writing Python code and you grab that from um, like Docker Hub or something like that, it'll have 1,400 vulnerabilities in it um, before you even start writing your code. Um, and it's like they include a bunch of extra stuff that you might not need. Stuff doesn't get updated frequently. And these are just stuff that everybody already knows is out there, these vulnerabilities. Um, and so that's what we fix. We update everything. We test it. We patch it. We strip stuff out. Yours has no vulnerabilities yeah, or just zero. a little less? It's zero. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, it's, uh, we have a zero CV SLA where like stuff gets found and we fix it within 7 to 14 days depending on that timeline. So like we keep it at zero. And that's part of the thing, right? Because ultimately like, you know, this stuff's all open source. Like what's the stuff, you know, once you fix something that becomes known to everybody or like how does that, how do you still stay kind of keeping, you're obviously delivering value, but how do you hold on to the value that, that you deliver? Yeah, it's a lot of work, a lot of automation. Um yeah, there's no there's no magic. It's just we, we just do it once. And it's um, there's that kind of analogy when you compare the two products. You've probably heard a bunch of like vitamins versus painkillers. Like, yeah, even if everybody knows this is good, like it's still hard to get people to take their vitamins, um, even if they know it's good and better in the long run versus like all my dashboards are on fire. I'm missing SLAs. My customers are yelling about these vulnerabilities Buy this thing and it immediately fixes that pain. Um, so it's a lot faster time to value. People get it a lot quicker um, and it kind of helps developers instead of gives them more work to do by telling them about more problems that they already know about. And what's the model here? Like, is it just like a SaaS fee per, per instance that you're running or like per what? Yeah. So it's, uh, we charge based on the amount of images from the catalog you're getting from us basically. And then there's like sliding tiers based on how big of a company it is. But yeah. We bill it like SaaS. So it's like an annual subscription basically, but like people run it on their own infrastructure. So they just download it from us and run it. Uh, so it's kind of like the best of both worlds. We're not running a ton of compute infrastructure for SaaS, but um, we're still you know, billing on a recurring subscription for all that update work. 
So give me a sense of timelines. I mean, you kind of start this in, you know, 2021, you raised 5 million, which you said was a very easy raise. And then you raise 50 million from Sequoia six months later, like in mid 22. What happened? Yeah. So, um, we were, we were just going in 2021. Um, we we're planning to raise at the end of that year or something like that. You know, we had our burn rate calculations, the team we hired, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, it was still crazy. The markets were still nuts. We were getting like random offers from people to preempt. And we were like, no, we'll wait, we'll wait, we'll wait. Preempt why, by the way? Like, what do you have at this point? I don't know. It was 2022. But I mean, dude, like, I so I get that. But at the same time, while that a lot of that was happening, just to tell you, like, it wasn't happening to everyone. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, what were you doing? <laughs> I just writing blogs. I like, yeah, it's, um, I, it's I this know. space. Like I get, I mean, the team's yeah. there, right. But yeah, I, team, I guess the space people, people were very hiring the space. Yeah. Mm, I see. We have ha- hiring a lot of like ex Google, ex like, you know, a list, whatever. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, all of a sudden our, our seed investors called and they were like, uh, stuff's getting a little rocky out there. You might want to try to raise. And we're like, oh, you just told us to say no to people like three weeks ago. What happened? And they're like, oh, it changed. Um, and uh, I happened to have a meeting with some of the folks from Sequoia the next day. They were coming in town for some conference. So I had dinner booked and I was like, oh, I'll just try to do it then. <laughs> um, had a great dinner and it was like, oh, well, let's stay in touch for when you're going to be raising. And it's like, why not right now? Um, and so, yeah, we like shook hands on terms that night at the dinner table. Um, and um, yeah, I remember like, yeah, they originally offered us less money. And I was like, how about we take more money? Because we're trying to survive this crazy market downturn. And they were even happier um, as a result. Did, did that change? Did them taking more money mean it was a different valuation? Or you just we pushed that up too, yeah. So it was like a little higher. They got more as well because we increased the size and stuff like that. But yeah, we, the whole process took you know three days before we had a term sheet and that kind of thing. Um, and then, yeah, it takes you know, a month or so to close. And So was that also, that was no pitch deck, no nothing? Yeah, nothing, yeah. Um, we, we've never done a pitch deck, even for the, the later rounds. Um, uh, but yeah, it was, it was quick. Uh, it was a month, um, to close. And I still remember at the end of the month, they were like, we wouldn't do this round again today. Like the markets had shifted so bad. Um, like just in that time. And I was so happy we got it done as quickly as we could. Do you have a sense of how they were backing into, you know, a pre-revenue business getting 50 million on, I mean, I don't know what the valuation, let's just say it was 200, 300, like it, it must've been in that range. Like how do they think about that? So I'm not an investor. Mr. You, not your, your problem. Yeah, I could never do your job. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> And it was a rough year. I mean, it, uh, layoffs hit, budgets hit. Um, we started to, like, we had some revenue targets for the year. That's about where we, that, I think that was the year where we ended, you know, a little over a million in ARR or something like that. Um, kind of on the wrong product. Um, and uh, then the next year is when things really started to shift for us over to the, uh, our images products. And we went all in there in 2023. Do you have any advice for founders raising pre-revenue or do you really just attribute 90 percent like some percentage to the team which you know people have the team that they have and then the rest is just the timing that nobody can do anything about timing helps i mean it's always part i mean the the markets change the markets are up and down um but yeah i mean it's the problem space you're going after i mean the, the tam calculations um i'm sure like customer diligence of like is this an area you're actually worried about especially in security but um i mean even through market downturn security is always strong so that always helps uh, but yeah, I'm sure it depends on the space. But that was post. That's like after the fact of them like being interested in the first place, right? The customer diligence. It, it depends. A lot of investors are doing it proactively. Yeah, uh, just get your name. About, like, I, I guess, like, I mean, the one thing I never understood is like the whole stealth thing of like we're just not going to tell anybody what we're working on. It's like I don't know why you do that. Um, you know, if, if you're out there, people hear about you, they talk about you, you get more intros to customers, you get more intros to people interested. Investors hear about all that stuff too. What were you doing to like be out there to like get your name? Kind Logs, of random press stuff. Um, early on, um, especially in 2022, we kind of knew no one was going to be buying anything, and it was a super hot space where there were new startups every week doing supply chain security, and um, we weren't doing sales yet. Like we didn't have a product yet. You know, we we're trying uh, early founder that stuff, but um, we made a decision to invest in like the brand side of it. Just do as much as we could, get our name out there as much. So it was like, let's try to end this year. Nobody's going to sell anything this year because it's so new and the markets are rough. Um, Let's just try to end the year as the most well-known company in the space. Um, so like, and you can do that pretty cheaply. Like, like, yeah. What did you, I mean, what's actually specifically, yeah. What did you do? I mean, there's always the conference stuff like that too, but like when there's news every couple of weeks about like the government, new regulations or some big hack or something like that, just build relationships with reporters, go, go talk to them. And like, all of a sudden you're getting quoted in stories and people see your name and your company and like all the stuff they're reading security news. 
uh, blog. What did you do podcasts, specifically? Like, like did one. you did you hit him up? You go for coffee with them? Like, how did you? What did you? Yeah, do? yeah. I mean, just email them to say, hey, like I, I've got thoughts on this, or like you would just post them on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, that's been huge too, especially as like uh, more people have shifted to LinkedIn. I wish we started that one earlier. Just go write your thoughts on LinkedIn, and um, you'll like, reporters if it's on interesting stuff, people are already covering. They'll reach out and be like, hey, can you comment on this story? Or hey, like, can I use a quote from your LinkedIn post on this story here and there? Um, it doesn't take a lot of time, and it, that definitely paid itself back over the years. So you became like a kind of the authority, like when all these kind of stories are happening, especially as it relates to security and open source, you're constantly getting quoted, and you just become the authority. And, and then people assume like, well, you must know what the hell you're talking about. If yeah, exactly. Just, you know, and like, like you can't you. make it like product, like blatant product or company pitch stuff of just like, here's what this means to the industry. Like you've got to actually be out there with genuine, interesting opinions on stuff. Um, and then what were the blogs about? Were the blogs also about high level problems and like your thoughts on this breach? Yeah, all of it. Stuff we're doing. Yeah. Um, but just the more content you put out there, the better. Stuff we're building. Yeah. Like it's just interesting internal stuff that engineers love to read or commentary on news, that kind of thing. So you've got the $50 million, like on a handshake deal, kind of month closed. The market totally turned. Your timing couldn't be better. But you have at this point, Little to no revenue or remind me, like where are you at? Yeah, like, zero like at that point. Think, zero, yeah, okay. Right. And yeah. you still have the two kind of products that you're working on? I think second half of 2022, we finally started to close some like early deals, design partners, POVs kind of thing. On both uh, products? Yeah. Um, or maybe yeah, like, one. yeah, mo- mo- mostly on the first one. Yeah. And then, yeah, ending the year, I think we got our f- like tiny first deal on the images product. And then, yeah, beginning. What was that first so, deal? Like how, what, what do we know, talk about? Size 50, 100K, something like that. Okay. Um, not yeah, bad. Not, not terrible. But yeah, it was probably like 90% on the enforced product. Um, yeah, wrapped up that year. We're still doing both as we headed into 2023 and really started to I guess, shift focus and lean into the images product. And yeah, when we had that second like, oh shit moment of like, we can't even keep up with demand. This is way bigger than we thought it was. It was going to be way faster. Um, that's when we did our series B. It's kind of like, you feel the product market fit. And yeah. But that was like the end of 2023. So you go from like, like September, just starting think, to get yeah. revenue, right? Okay. So just, you're just starting to get revenue in beginning of 2023. And then what do you end that year with? How long were we ended the year with? Um, when we did the Series B, it was like Q2, Q3. We had just built a real sales team. We had like two sales reps. We brought in a sales leader. We had a good quarter. And uh, that's when we did the Series B right after. And you were at what? Like a couple million euro? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So like very impressive, very impressive growth in kind of that 2023 phase. What clicked? Like what happened? What worked in 2023? Um, I think, you know, one of the things I look back at is like, I, w- I wish we hired our first couple sales reps earlier. Um, and, you know, the normal investor advice is like founder led sales until the first couple million before you do that. Um, and I, I agree with parts of it. Like, I think there's like that, you know, stereotype of like technical founder thinks they'll just build a product and then hire a bunch of fancy salespeople to sell it later. Um, I think like, but there's a, a huge difference in like the talking to customers, value selling, doing that vision pitch, and then like actually knowing how to get through a six month procurement cycle at an enterprise. And like, if you've never done that before, like people that have are incredibly valuable. And I wish we did that earlier. Cause like all of a sudden, like conversations we had going forever, like just speed up when you know, when you have somebody that knows how to So do you it. hired like enterprise sales people to get the thing done. Not, I was thinking more like BDR stuff just to- No, yeah, we hired two and yeah, the advice get two sales reps when you do it. Yeah, we did that. And uh, all of a sudden everything just started going faster. And who was making those initial calls? Was that you then? Like, doing Oh yeah. Like you still have to stay in, yeah, you still have to stay involved in it, but like just have sales reps with you. Um, they can sniff stuff out. Like they can tell right away if like you're just getting let on and the deal's not going to go anywhere. Like they see, especially if you've never done this kind of thing before, they see signals you're not going to see, or you think something's going nowhere. And then all of a sudden they figure out the magic people to go email and procurement and all of a sudden stuff gets done. Um, like it's a huge skill and like sales reps make a lot of money and they deserve every penny. <laughs> um, it's a hard job, especially if you've never done it. So I wish we did that part a little bit earlier, but I completely understand where the advice comes from around like you've got to do all the sales yourself to a certain point. How many people like when after you raise that 50 million bucks, you have like 10, 15 people. How many people do you grow to in the, over the next like six to They're probably like 35, 40. Um, okay. So you think pretty the time small. we did our B. Yeah. Uh, 40, yeah. 40, 50, something like, yeah. I mean, it's markets had crashed. Nobody had any idea how long it was going to last for. It's kind of a whole year where nobody invested in anything. Um, and then finally some deals started getting done again. And I think investors just got a little bit bored sitting on the sidelines and passing for a whole year while they waited to figure out how to value companies again. Um, yeah, that was yeah toward the end of 2023. When you raise your series B, if you have 35 people or so, you raise 50 million. I mean, you must have like 30 million in the bank. Is that about right? Yeah, we still have yeah, still money left. Lot, but, um, when right? you're looking at scaling the sales, scaling over to market even more, it starts to get expensive. Uh, and yeah, it's like 
you know, you could just keep going this way, you know what the burn is, you know how long you can last, but like if you want to grow faster, you've got to you've got to grow and you've got to hire more. And it's that other one too, like you don't want to raise when you're desperate and when you need to. So it always gets harder then. Well, that seems like consistently something that that you did well and you know, some of them came to you, but in general, you're always kind of fundraising when you I mean, when you're totally in in control. Everybody has a different risk tolerance for, you know, how much you want to have left in the bank at the time you go raise, but um yeah, you don't want to be desperate. So where are you at today? Like how many employees do you have? How many customers do you have? 180, 190 employees now, something like that. Um, about 100 customers. And ACVs for you are in that 50, 100K range? Uh, probably 225, 250, somewhere around there. They're pretty Oh, uh, okay. So it's yeah. really enterprise. It's all enterprise sales. Awesome. Okay, cool. Well, we'll end it there. I mean, I guess the, the two questions that we always end on, the first one we touched on, but but I'll get your kind of specific answer anyways, is like, when did you feel like you had true product market fit? Yeah, it's that that saying of like, uh, you'll know it when you feel it. If you're asking if you have it, you don't have it um, kind of thing of like, you know, it's like a slap in the face, I guess, of like, um, yeah, when you can't keep up with the demand, when the pipeline is just coming in, you don't even know where it's coming from. Um, and you're, yeah, the, your sales team is busy. Uh, you know, it's different in every type of sales motion too. Like, yeah, with enterprise, it's like you can tell when the sales team is busy and you can tell when you need more of them. The last question is if you could go back in time to when you were just starting chain guard with like one piece of advice for yourself what might that be yeah i mean there, there's tons of ways to look at that question you know there's like this if you knew the markets were gonna like you know shit the bed without like yeah, without yeah, a crystal yeah. Ball. so without yeah, exactly. yeah without a crystal ball it's a little harder i mean there's you know tons of mistakes here and there and stuff you learn i think biggest one would have been like get um get those first couple reps earlier um and then yet yeah, more confidence in growing that earlier reps in what sales reps sorry yeah. oh i see okay yeah. We'll stop it there. Dan, appreciate you jumping on the show, man. It's been great. Yeah, thanks. I just gave you content that you liked so much, you actually listened to the end. And guess what? You didn't pay a single dollar. Not only that, I didn't even put any ads in your face. So you just got a bunch of content for free. And now that I've delivered that value, I'm asking for something in return. Open your app, open Apple Podcasts, open Spotify, open whatever app you use to listen to this and hit that follow button. It's actually going to help you because it's going to help you make sure you don't miss out on the next episode, which you like so much that you listen to the whole thing.